Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You're welcome. <coughs> With the grace and uh, invitation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are once again having a uh, discussion on uh, revisionism concerning al-Islam as it should be and uh, also as it was twisted, if you will, if I can use that word. Today I would like to talk with you, brother, um, about um, the document that is commonly known as the uh, Medina Constitution. Now, my understanding of it is not as uh, clear as I would like it to be, and I'm sure that's the case for most of our listeners. Um, there's been an awful lot of, how shall I say, um, avoidance of this document, I suppose, for various reasons. Um, and, and at the same time, there's also some controversy over it. It's come to my attention that uh, some scholars consider it a part of the Hadith, uh, although it's not uh, officially in Hadith, but it falls into that category. And also, uh, it also falls into the category of what would be considered a weak Hadith uh, on, uh, at, at the, um, in the opinion of some scholars. Uh, others don't seem to differentiate. However, um, there's a large amount of uh, discussion that can, and, and by academics and others who consider the document to be genuine. It appears to me, from my position as a sort of outsider here, uh, to be genuine, uh, but from a different perspective. Uh, now, the perspective that I have is I'm outside looking in, and I'm looking in at this thing, and I read clause so-and-so, and I follow down all the way from beginning to end, and it seems to me to be a document that makes common sense. It's not something that seems to have any kind of an agenda. There's no interference on the part of uh, Muhammad to um, govern the tribes uh, at all that are concerned with the document, with the agreement. Uh, it's some sort of a loose but yet uh, firmly tied um, agreement for mutual defense. Uh, and then uh, it just specifies certain consequences if this uh, agreement is um, as, uh, not held by either of the, any of the parties who are involved. So it's not necessarily a constitution, it's more of, a, of an alliance uh, by a group of uh, tribes that might be considered um, uh, a, a federation of sorts. Some of them were uh, Muslims, some of them were had been Muslims for years, others were newly Muslims, others were people who were interested in Islam, or at least in the phenomena that uh, al-Islam was uh, bringing to the earth at that time. And others were sort of just drawn into it by virtue of time and circumstance and place, you see. They just happened to be there. I mean, if you look at Medina at the time of the Prophet's arrival there, it was called Yathrib. Why the name was changed is not clear to me, but uh, I'm sure it's not clear to many of our listeners as well. But the name was changed. And... Uh, if we listen to Instructor Bilal, it was purposely changed because it has to do with the Dean, Medina, you see. So uh, I think that that's in, an interesting uh, perspective that needs to be pursued. But at the same time, uh, while we look at this thing and we look at the circumstances, we also see that uh, the Prophet was not in a quote-unquote, uh, power base. You know, he was 
as Al Islam is, he was invited, you see, by the uh, people who were sympathetic to him and Islam in Medina. They said, please come, come to us and uh, we'll support you. And besides, we need your wisdom. And so they, because we have a lot of intertribal uh, problems here and we'd like to have them settled. Well, I don't think they were calling him to be king or anything of that nature. I think they were calling on his wisdom <coughs> to help them, you know, to, to, to make the appropriate choices. So it wasn't, it is not a matter of, you know, a political uh, uh, dynasty or a political presidency or some, anything of that nature. There was a group of people in Medina who were the minority. I mean, the Jews were not necessarily a minority there. And we're also talking about a group of people that were not large in number. I mean, there's, I, I suppose there's no way to really know how many people were living in Yathrib at the time. But uh, it seems to me that there, there were somewhere between 500 to 2,000 people involved. This is not a lot of people. So although there are more than a dozen tribes or so mentioned in this document, we're, we're not talking about large groups of differentiated uh, people. We're, these are not large groups. These were small groups, and uh, they were having their problems. The Jews were the dominant force in Yathrib. They were the ones, uh, this off, uh, all uh, uh, tribe, whatever they were, they were the ones with the castle. They were the only ones that had a castle there. They had a castle. This is not a, a, a small matter in the middle of the desert, you know, where you don't have many, uh, uh, many attributes and resources to call on. So um, they were threatened by inner and outer uh, forces. Inner meaning, look, the tribes didn't all get along even though they're in the same place. And this, we can't compare our understanding of human relations and interpolitical, interpolit intertribal relations uh, today, we can't compare those to what was taking place a thousand, twelve hundred years ago. There's different circumstances, different mindsets, different customs, different laws. Yeah, we can all say, oh, well, they're all human beings, but we have to adjust to time and circumstance. And that's what Islam is all about, from my perspective. So they were having trouble externally and internally. And with the arrival of Muhammad, the external threat was amplified because the Quraysh in Mecca wanted to squelch him. I mean, the only reason he was there was because they tried to murder him, to the best of my knowledge. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made sure that that didn't happen uh, for obvious reasons. Now, so the Prophet is invited, which is an Islamic principle. We want to invite uh, people to Islam. We want to invite people to the truth. We want to invite people to peaceful correlations. That's fine. So they invited the prophet. Why? Well, because whoever was there must have had some confidence in his ability to solve their problems and perhaps to solve problems in a wider range of uh, considerations at the time. And they wanted to protect him. Well, that's a sort of a divine thing. I mean, you don't get invitations from strangers, you know, who want to protect you all that every day this does just doesn't happen so that's also an a, an aspect that happened by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the prophet is invited he gives his speech when he enters and he gives certain uh directives in this speech with respect to islam and the kingship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, the dominion that's coming uh, by virtue of his presence there, and that if they wish to maintain this dominion, they have to respect the king of the universe and obey his laws. And as long as they do that, it's like the you know Moses telling the Israelites, you obey these Ten Commandments, you're going to keep your dominion, you see. Well, 
Muhammad said pretty much the same thing when he entered Medina. And lo and behold, a generation later, the Muslims forgot the speech. And by the time I was uh, invited to join the faculty at uh, uh, ISTAC in Kuala Lumpur, most people I, just thought, uh, I discussed these matters with uh, hadn't heard of the Medina Constitution. You know, there were a few, but most of the students didn't know about it. Now you have to ask a question, well, why is that the case? If the document is in fact genuine, why was it avoided in academic discussions? Why is it now making new inroads in certain discussions with, with respect to revisionism? Why is it controversial when it shouldn't be? There's nothing controversial about it. If you look about, if you look at it from a uh, common sense perspective, okay, we want to get along. We want to protect each other. We don't want to uh, betray each other. We have an external force that wants to destroy us. So let's all get along despite our differences in faith, despite our differences in tribal allegiance. Okay. So one of the things I really liked about this and is in keeping with the Hanbali uh, model of the caliphate is that the prophet took no authority over tribal affairs, okay, including any of the tribes that were involved in this confederation. There was no imposition of his will indicated anywhere in the document, okay? In other words, the people, the elders, the chiefs of all the tribes involved maintain their autonomy. Now, as I read through uh, a dissertation on the Hanbali uh, Caliphate years and years ago, now when I was uh, doing editing at uh, ISTAC, one of the PhD students there did a dissertation on this, and I was really impressed with it because this same autonomy is maintained in the Hanbali Caliphate, model of the Caliphate. In other words, the caliph did not enter into, or his representations, representatives did not enter into tribal affairs. So he was there in the event that the tribes could not resolve their inner or inter relationships. If they had quarrels, then they were sort of just uh, shuffled up the uh, rung uh, to his court so that he would then settle them. Okay but he did not impose his will on the tribal chiefs. They maintained local autonomy, okay, according to the Hanbali uh, Caliphate. And that's what I found interesting in the Medina Constitution, the same model, the same principle. I am here to maintain your uh, order in the event of mutual defense. Ah, now I like this because that's the same principle upon which the United States of America was founded. The central government was there only for the sake of mutual defense of all the indiv individual states. The states were to, to maintain their own autonomy. So here's three elements, you see, where this principle of uh, local autonomy was supposed to be preserved, and it wasn't, you see was only preserved for a limited time uh, with the Medina Constitution, to the best of my knowledge. So um, with that having been said, brother, I invite you to uh, share with us your perspective on this document. Is it genuine? Where does it fit if it's part of the Hadith literature? And where does it fit with respect to the models that we've been given and haven't been given with respect to the genuine or authentic uh, caliphate uh, or governance of al-Islam as a political institution in the earth, inshallah. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Brother uh, Omar, uh, for this opportunity to share some thoughts with you and the viewers on this, uh, I think, very important document I might add or begin by saying that, uh, first of all, um, I would like to begin by saying that uh, I happen to be a, a student of political science, 
and uh, constitution are very important in politics, political theory to be more precise, or political philosophy if you prefer. Mm -hmm. So now a constitution is a very important political document. It is a document that de defines the vision of a community of itself and of course also its mission. It is mm -hmm. something like a mission statement, mission and yeah. vision statement. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> of course, yeah, from the Islamic perspective, any kind of political constitution uh, should uh, reflect Quranic values and principles. I think that should go without saying, but it is better to say it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, there are people even who say that, uh, like in Saudi Arabia, uh, you, you may hear uh, ulama say, state that, well, our constitution is the Quran. All right, you could put it that way. Um, so now uh, to, to uh, come back to the importance of this particular uh, constitution, the Medina Charter, uh, the uh, the first time I heard the charter being referred to as a hadith was by my former uh, boss and mentor, Professor Dr. Muhammad Hashim Kamali, who is the chief executive, uh, I mean, uh, officer of the International Institute of Advanced Islamic Studies here in Malaysia, where I was a research fellow for 10 years. I worked with him and for him editing and writing. So I remember he said at one time in one of our meetings with the research fellows, in response to the people who claim that the Quran, Quran centric people who claim that um, there were no hadith at the time of the prophet, he uh, retorted to that by saying, but we had the, or there was the Medina constitution. So he, he treats the Medina constitution as a, as an example of hadith. Of course, it's a very different kind of hadith if you want to consider it as a hadith. Mm -hmm. I think what he meant was that the Medina Charter is a, is a, a written document that has been preserved, or mm -hmm. so we uh, would like to believe, and that <clears throat> that sort of outlined the relationship between uh, the different communities in Medina at the time you know, set, set down, so to speak, the rules of the game, if you like, uh, what, what is expected of everyone and uh, what are people's, I mean, the different communities' uh, duties and, and, uh, and rights. So you could think of it as a kind of a rule book, a political rule book, uh, the, the, the rules that the different communities uh, should follow. Because as we know also, I think there are reasonable uh, reason to believe, there are good, uh, fairly solid reasons to believe that yes, the Medina community was actually uh, a multicultural community. Mm -hmm. This was not a homogenous community. And why do I say that? Well, uh, I say it because for one, uh, interestingly, <clears throat> the Jews were considered to be part of the Ummah in the Medina constitution. Yes. Now think what would happen if you publicly announced that to the uh, Muslim world today, that uh, the Jews should be part of the Ummah also, even today. Now, mm -hmm. what do you think you would be getting as a response? Mm -hmm. So, to me, it, this shows that there was a level of tolerance by the Prophet at the time of the Prophet, and, uh, which was reflected in the Medina Charter, uh, whereby uh, the Muslims, even though they were in charge of the, uh, the city-state as a whole, they nevertheless gave rights to the different communities to coexist as a single Ummah uh, under the Charter of Medina and also as military al allies, as you mentioned, in case of an external attack, they would all help each other to repel, uh, you know, the attacker. <clears throat> and if my uh, former mentor was uh, right, he also mentioned that the Prophet waged uh, as many as 64 military engagements during uh, his time in Medina. Now, mm -hmm. some people put that number at a lower level, say 29, that is probably a point of disagreement. But what I'm trying to say is that the young Medina, the nascent Medina community had plenty of enemies. Yes. And so there were conflicts and there was a need for this kind of a political union mm -hmm. established for the purpose of self-preservation. And we must remember also that our Quran, Allah Ta'ala in the Quran refers to, uh, we have the people of the book mentioned in our Quran, uh, Jews and the Christians. And there are even verses that say nice things about the Jews and the Christians and uh, mm -hmm. some others, Sabians. 
uh, in Arabic, uh, I think, uh, and also those people who believe and do good deeds, which is a very general uh, statement in mm-hmm. Arabic, it goes like this. Alladina amanu wa amilu solihad la khofun alayhim wa la hum Yes, yes, yes. Those who believe, that's point one, and those who do good deeds, on them shall be no fear and neither sh- shall they grieve. So mm-hmm. that to me doesn't sound like uh, these people are going to the fire, far from That's it. That's right. This so is not both, a condemnation. Both, mm-hmm. Of course. So both the Quran and the Medina Charter, show, uh, which uh, the Charter which reflects it, the Quran, the tolerance of the Quran, they both constitute evidence that Islam actually, when correctly understood, is a very tolerant, inclusive, inclusive uh, religion. Mm-hmm. This fact, I think, is lost on some of our brothers and sisters today who tend to take uh, a, an ethnocentric perspective, perhaps somewhat tribalistic perspective, and some of them will even argue that uh, the, the Prophet was somehow commanded to expel all non-Muslims from the Arabian Peninsula. And this mm-hmm. is the thinking, I would say, of, uh, uh, how do I put this, extremists, like Ibn Taymiyyah and the Islamists, mm-hmm. who have, well, I think, a very... Yeah, go ahead, brother. If, if I could impose for just a minute. Please, um, go ahead. That's the consensus that was taught to me by my colleagues when I was at uh, ISTEC. This was the um, agreed-upon perspective that the Prophet, indeed, had cast all these non-Muslims who were still involved with idolatry out of the peninsula. Okay. Uh, and then later they were invited back uh, because of certain talents and gifts as builders and whatnot, the artists that the, the Arabs didn't have, you see, amongst their own tribesmen. So that is, uh, the, I found that very, I embraced that idea. I said, well, if everyone says that's what happened, that must be what happened. Why, who am I to question it? So now you're bringing this up to my ear for the first time and saying, oh, well, that's not what the prophet did, or perhaps, you know, that's not what he did. And, but even Tamea said he did do this. So we know, well, there's another questionable source in the minds of some of us who are studying these matters, in the minds of some others, even Tamea is like the Pope, you see. He uh, is infallible. <laughs> so, um, what what the true perspective is, I'm all ears, you see, uh, as well as I'm sure others of our audience and uh, students and fellows and ladies. <laughs> yeah, so I think what we have witnessed here uh, is what Muhammad Shahrur uh, referred to as a, uh, in his book called Quran, Morality and Critical Reason available Mm -hmm. online, free in PDF format, published in 2007. It was a big success in Damascus, Syria, when it was first published. It went through many reprints, but of course it also attracted the ire of at least 22 uh, Sunni ulama who wrote critiques trying to rebut the the arguments that Shah Mm -hmm. makes in his book. Mm -hmm. But anyway, what he said was that what happened in Islamic intellectual history was uh, what he called uh, the, the... uh, let me put it this way, I think how we put it was that uh, as a result of the so-called, I'm paraphrasing, but pretty close to the original, as a result of the so-called uh, tafsir or exegesis of the traditional ulama, Islam has lost its universality. Uh, In other words, the universal teaching of the of Islam was lost because what they brought into the uh, their tafsir were various tribal perspectives, uh, ethnocentric leanings. Uh, we find it, for example, even in Ibn Kathir's uh, uh, writing on uh, abrogation. He uh, states, uh, break, uh, I mean, uh, in complete uh, defiance of what our Quran teaches on the subject, that the Quran abrogated the previous revelations. Now, mm-hmm. I cannot believe that. He, where, how did he bring himself to write such a statement which flies so blatantly and directly against what the Quran teaches on the subject. Mm-hmm. I am, uh, was uh, having these discussions with my students and I, 
I couldn't, uh, you know, I had to write a rebuttal, so to speak, of my own on this view. Mm -hmm. And that's how my paper on abrogation began. Later it turned into a book and now it's already in the public domain. Does the final testament abrogate the Old and New Testaments? And I give the, the answer to it, uh, that the answer is no. And I have 20 verses in the Quran to prove uh, prove the point. Mm -hmm. So I, I fear that so-called traditional tafsir, such as that of uh, Ibn Kathir, and even, uh, uh, you know, is uh, and the writing of Ibn Taymiyyah, uh, or for example, on Jihad al-Talab, I, I fear that, to me at least, both of these and others who think along the same lines are basically very unreliable and, in fact, misleading. Mm -hmm. So they, they have brought, uh, they have, uh, uh, like, uh, I don't know where do I begin, perhaps it's best to go to the uh, Medina Charter, back to the Charter. So yes, the, the Charter, the, what is the significance of the Charter for us? It, it gives us a, a model if because we have plenty of people who are calling for the so-called Islamic State, mm -hmm. and uh, their idea of Islamic State is that everything has to be the same, it has to be homogenous, that there is no room for a plurality of ethnic groups. Mm -hmm. So I even remember one time I uh, said in a meeting at one of the think tanks, yeah, not the one I was working for, but a different one, mm -hmm. that something to the effect, what's wrong with multiculturalism, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the local people spoke up after me and said, we don't want that here, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, even though the country basically contains, Malaysia has at least three, uh, you know, major groups, the Malays, the Chinese, and the Indians, a sprinkling of expats, so he mm -hmm. was very strongly against the multiculturalism, even though this multi uh, recognition of, of the multiplicity, multiplicity of uh, nations and tribes is recognized by none other than Allah Ta'ala Himself in Surah Hujarat, where mm -hmm. He says, uh, We have made you into nations and tribes so that you may know one another, not that you may hate one another. Mm -hmm. So I fear that what has happened, partly as a result of this uh, so-called traditional exegesis and tafsir, uh, is that people, uh, uh, people's understanding of the teaching of the Quran was, I fear, uh, corrupted, let me put it straight. And I know I'm yeah. not alone in this because mm -hmm. I know that uh, Professor Naki Balatas has expressed reservations about what happened to knowledge. I believe that he stated it in some of his mm -hmm. works that yes, we we have a problem of the corruption of knowledge. Of Even course. Brother uh, Hamza Yusuf agreed with that right there in his presence. I saw in a video that where he was having a discussion with the professor. Also said, how do we deal with this problem of corruption of knowledge? Mm -hmm. And also the son of uh, professor, the professor uh, Taufik Alatas. Mm -hmm. I also read an article from him where he, uh, you know, uh, uh, raises this very same issue: the corruption of knowledge. So I fear to say that our traditional uh, tafsir, our traditional exegesis, rather than helping us to gain a better understanding of the Quran, actually achieved more or less the reverse. Mm -hmm. And I could uh, use other, you know, examples of evidence that prove my point. Mm -hmm. I don't want to divert, but I would just briefly mention the whole concept of jihad al talab or aggressive jihad, or the notion that we have to spread. Islam by the sword. This is one of the biggest travesties that I have come across in yes. my reading of the sec secondary literature, and I'm utterly shocked that mm -hmm. this view even emerged in the first place. And secondly, if it did emerge, I would have expected that it would remain a minority view, but unfortunately, it did not. It became mm -hmm. the majority view. In mm -hmm. fact, so much so that uh, Ibn Rushd said that practically all the classical ulama considered this aggressive jihad, jihad al-talab, to be part of the deen, a sixth pillar of Islam. So mm -hmm. now, you see, the Medina Charter is a model for the Muslim societies to follow, and uh, they should show greater tolerance for the diversity within their own countries, and give them uh, the various ethnicities that are part of their you know, uh, nation, Give them enough room, just like you mentioned, the, the Prophet himself did not interfere in the tribal affairs of the various ethnic groups that made up the Ummah, you see. Yes. So here, when people say we should follow the Sunnah of the Prophet, I, I agree 100%. Yes, mm -hmm. we should follow this Sunnah, which 
was a sunnah of tolerance and inclusion rather than a sunnah of intolerance and exclusion. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, I, I had struggled with this uh, personally when I entered the Ummah. Now, if you know my story, I converted to Islam in the mountains of uh, East uh, Malaysia at near the Kalimantan border up there. And uh, there was no masjid anywhere near me. There were no Muslims anywhere near me. It was simply as the result of reading Al-Quran as critically as I could. I read the translation by Yusuf Ali and I was very impressed with it despite whatever errors it may or may not contain. Uh, the Quran comes forth even in mistranslation, it still shines forth with the truth. So I became a Muslim. I confess whatever you might consider to be the Shahada in the middle of the night uh, on Christmas, um, I forget what year, 2005, I think it was. And then I entered the Ummah about a year later, all right, because I could no longer stay they changed the immigration laws and my christian uh, wife's family uh, exiled me and whatnot so i went to west malaysia and i entered the umba in uh in, in all its inglorious uh, being and what i met there was not what i read in the quran and i was firmly uh, convinced that had i been initially influenced by the Ummah in Malaysia, I never would have become a Muslim. Now, why do I say this? I say this because everyone was interested in imposing their ideas on my personal religious practice. So that meant that they were constantly invading my personal space. And I consider this tyranny. And of course, I'm not allowed to object to it because who? Do, what do I know? I'm just a baby Muslim here. It's kind of like the Christian saying, oh, he's just a baby Christian. What does he know? I would say, well, I, you know, I've been around the world already. I was 55 years old. I had 25 years of medical practice under my belt, which is not a small thing to consider uh, when you're dealing with human nature, especially if you're an emergency room doctor like I was in inner cities. You see, so I had been blooded, I had been vetted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then suddenly I become a Muslim and I'm treated as if I'm a know nothing child again. You see, that later. Well, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do the next thing, you gotta do this, 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 you gotta say Alhamdulillah 30,000 times, you gotta. I, I said, where's all this coming from? When, when I read the Al Quran and what I could, of uh, the Syria, I didn't see any of that. Matter of fact, I saw the prophet meeting one young man who uh, came to him and said, uh, you know, Muhammad, I, uh, I I can't do all the things that you do. I, you know, you get up in the middle of the night, you do this, you do the next thing. And he said, I, I, I can't do that. And was the prophet angry with him? Did, did the prophet turn around and speak to him severely? No, no, no. He said, do the best you can of whatever you do, you see. And there's another reference to another fellow who uh, uh, Muhammad said, oh, Allah really loves so-and-so. And one of the companions got upset about that because so-and-so wasn't a particularly pious fellow. And Muhammad said, well, you go and live with him for a few days. And so he did. Then he came back a week later and said, you know, I'm still not impressed. This guy doesn't do this. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do the next thing. But Muhammad said, Shh. what he does do, he does faithfully and with the best of intentions. And so when I read that, as I was reviewing the seer, I said, hey, why are all these people trying to change me into them? You see? You see, this is, uh, this is what we're talking about when we're talking about uh, pluralism, okay? I can be a Muslim and I can retain the individual characteristics that Allah had blessed me with and brought me to maturity with, you see? 
I don't have to be like you. I don't have to dress like you. I don't have to talk like you even, you see. So then we have this uh, intermediary class developed, you see, I saw over the periods of time. And I said, oh my gosh, these people are just like the Christian priesthood. They're no different than the Catholic priesthood or the Orthodox priesthood or the new Protestant priesthood with this pastoral uh, uh, mentality. You know, you, you have to have a leader, but you don't have to have this sort of communist idea that everybody has to dress in the same uniform and speak the same way and salute in the same manner. You see? And that's what I saw was happening, and I saw so much fitna as a result of it, because the individual cannot express themselves under such a an imposition. The fitra, which is both the same but yet different in each of us, because it cannot grow. If you're going to force it into some sort of mold that Allah did not mold, but man molded, you see, then that thing that Allah wants to develop, that person, that personality, those gifts, they cannot develop, and they don't develop. And so when I conf was confronted with this lack of pluralism, I was shocked, I was amazed. And uh, eventually, you know, I, 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 I left, especially after five years on, after 9-11, I'm still attending convocations in the Muslims, are up on the stage still blaming Muslims for it. And then I saw 10 years later, however, however many years later it was, they're, in, they're inviting people to receive the vaccine, the COVID vaccine. I'm saying, well, these people are not guided. These are people are considered to be their imams, their uh, shura. And I said, how uninformed are they? And why is this happening? Well, it's because of a certain degree of conformity to this traditional lie, because once you start following a lie, all the other lies seep in. And then justice cannot be manifest because no one knows the truth of the matter. And if you don't know the truth, how can you defend it, you see? So therefore I came to the conclusion that ignorance serves evil. And here's a perfect example of it, you see, in the Muslim, so-called Muslim Ummah. And so, uh, with that being said, brother, I uh, want us to return to the uh, Medina Constitution and see how it is that the Prophet molded his uh, initial political relationship so that it, ref it would reflect Pisa, that it would reflect the, 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 the purpose of a federation of nations, a federation of tribes, a federation of peoples rather than a group of people all behaving like communist China. Or Nazi Germany, you might add. Or Nazi <coughs> Germany, yeah, it's the same principle, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, this, I think the key is the recognition of uh, diversity, you know, as actually an asset rather than a liability. And this is what some of our Muslim brothers and sisters, uh, I think, fail to realize that to have a diverse community, one ummah, where there's room even for non-Muslims, uh, and uh, they are, because as we know, there is no compulsion in religion, uh, Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 256. But for some reason, we these some of the ulama come along and they try to play the policeman and then try to force people to this and that and they invent so many crimes. According to Shahrur, uh, there are only four crimes uh, in the Quran, but they're like murders, uh, stealing, adultery, and false accusation. But when you look at the works of the ulama, they come up with a list of about a hundred crimes, uh, criminal offenses. <laughs> I think this is very, very shocking, very tragic, and it uh, turns uh, being a Muslim into a burden. I'm not surprised that people want to leave the deen because who can uh, put up with that kind of a thing? Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, also with the hadith, how they have been, uh, how they have uh, con some of the hadith contaminated our knowledge of the deen, how they have been mixed up with the Quran, even mm -hmm. treated as equal or even superior to the Quran in being able to judge, abrogate, and replace some of the ruins of the Quran. 
I think these are all very catastrophic developments. But uh, the, the point about the political document is that I was even, I gave a talk uh, my first year at the Islamic Science University mm -hmm. of Malaysia. I was asked to give a talk on uh, p political and religious tolerance in Islam, mm -hmm. and I did that. And then I turned my uh, little talk into a, I mean, I expanded my paper. Now it's published, in fact, um, uh, I have now published it under the title of pluralism, actually. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to highlight in, in this paper <clears throat> something that was the practice of the Prophet and something that actually he, uh, he is found in the Quran. Allah Ta'ala is asking us to be tolerant. And uh, the Medina constitution reflects this spirit of tolerance, but as a result of the work of some of the ulama, this spirit of tolerance turned into its opposite, almost like a monster, a spirit of intolerance, compulsion, mm -hmm. and what have you. So now we have people teaching. You should read what Al-Mawardi says about people who don't pray. I mean, it's like he has a list of to different tortures that this person should <laughs> undergo. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and this, 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 this is a major uh, figure, you know, in Islam. Uh -huh. uh, you know, you have already, we have already uh, touched on what Ibam al Ghazali says about music, the sound of musical instruments coming out of a house. Uh, go into the house and break the musical instruments. I mean, mm -hmm. these are not, uh, you know, uh, as it were, minor scholars. These are the so called giants of Islamic uh, intellectual history. Mm -hmm. Where did these get these ideas that all this compulsion is, is, is valid and. Uh, under the Sharia, as we find it in the Quran, you see. Mm -hmm. So the the we need to go back to the Medina Constitution to to uh, recover the spirit of tolerance of um, Islamic mm -hmm. polity. I don't think it is wrong for a political community to be, uh, you know, uh, designated as an Islamic political community in a sense that Islam is the official religion of the state, as is the case in Malaysia. But at the same time, the ethnic minorities have the right to, as long as they do so within the law, have the right to pursue their ways of life undisturbed. And that actually does reflect to some extent the, the uh, Medina constitution. But mm -hmm. there are always tendencies, you will find chauvinistic people almost in every community who want to go beyond the limits and be begin enforcing things on people and even, you know, uh, basically we have the danger of despotism arising and tyranny arising and injustice mm -hmm. arising out of this immoderate behavior of some of the people who, some of the persons who uh, have, I think, a limited grasp of the teaching of the Quran and mm -hmm. they simply want to force people left, right and center. And like if we even have laws about close proximity and what have you and other others and uh, f be fined and, and, and uh, of course Al Azhar University still teaches that people who do not attend the congregational prayers have to be killed. W where does this extremism come from? I'm totally shocked mm -hmm. because I don't see any of it in the Quran and I don't see any of it in the in Medina constitution either. So no. we Muslims need to familiarize ourselves with our own literature, uh, not uh, the Quran, yes, first and foremost, because we have a huge problem of Quran illiteracy. We know that already. People recite the Quran without knowing what they are saying, just like a, a tape recorder, basically. Mm -hmm. And then we need to familiarize ourselves also with documents like uh, the Medina, Medina constitution, which actually gives us the, how, the way of the prophet. It is uh, the, uh, the, his sunnah, you see, which was a mm -hmm. uh, su sunnah of accommodation, tolerance, and good relations with uh, other communities, you see. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we need to counter these tendencies to, towards intolerance, which I think come from two sources. One, problematic hadith, and two, uh, the work of some of the ulama, you know, uh, like mm -hmm. I mentioned already, Ibn Taymiyyah, we can throw in uh, Said Qutb, we can also put in uh, Maududi, and anyone else who uh, who has these, uh, you know, distorted, uh, co corrupted understanding, you see, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, what the Book of Allah actually is teaching us. He, these ideas are based on, I think, very careless reading of the Quran, mm -hmm. if they read it at all, because some of them sound like they haven't read it. Like when you, uh, Imam al-Ghazali mm -hmm. said, go and break into somebody's house and destroy the, those in musical instruments. I mean, hasn't he read Surah, uh, you know, An-Nur, where Allah says you have to first ask for permission to enter and say, Assalamu alaikum. And 
you get a completely different uh, version of, of mm -hmm. Islam. And also, he liked to quote a hadith according to which uh, the Prophet prohibited eating of beef. I mean, mm -hmm. this is just unbelievable. <laughs> but anyway, to, to come back to the main point, I think part, one reason why Islam is acquiring a, a, a poor reputation is because of these extreme misinterpretations of the deen that are being, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bandied about by a certain, uh, you know, uh, uh, groups or teachers or preachers that actually, in fact, don't have a very good understanding of what the Quran says. And uh, with their extremist uh, statements, uh, they are actually giving a bad reputation to, to everyone uh, to, uh, mm -hmm. who is a Muslim. And they have to be stopped. And it's, we, it is us, the Muslims, that have to take action against these, I would say, wavered individuals. I mean, you get mm -hmm. a foreign example at fatwa from a leading Muslim cleric that it's okay to commit a suicide bombing. My God, mm -hmm. what is that? And who mm -hmm. is he to make Allah something that Allah made haram? I mean, mm -hmm. he took upon himself the role of being God by saying that, well, Allah prohibited taking life without just cause, but I'm allowing you to do it. So is he yes. a higher authority than Allah? And mm -hmm. of course, later he withdrew his, uh, he recanted and uh, uh, withdrew his uh, really sickening fatwa, but uh, how much damage has already been done? The damage was and done. Was, of course, and it's still being done, you see. Yes. So these people have been taught that a Muslim can take the law into the, his or her own hands. That's, again, based on the Hadith. So th there's a lot of work ahead of us. People have lost the ability to differentiate between the Hadith and the Quran. They treat them as if they are interchangeable. There's even a statement uh, by Ibn Abbas on his website that the Sunnah is a part of the Quran. Part of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And... Um, mm -hmm. Similar statements, there are some hadiths according to which the Prophet dispatched the death squad to kill some pregnant poetess in her sleep because uh, she wrote some unflattering poetry about him. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what kind of hadith is that? To me, this is mm -hmm. a very slanderous hadith. It is actually offensive and, mm -hmm. and makes the Prophet look bad, you see. Yes, how, yes, how can yes, such yes. a hadith have been ever be included in a hadith book, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, I remember the, the time I, just, I stopped reading Bukhari was when I, when I came across a hadith according to which the Prophet said he wanted to burn down somebody's house because he saw the person inside was not getting ready to go to Friday prayer. I said, what? Excuse me? What? Burn down somebody's house? Yeah, there's a hadith oh like God. that in Bukhari. I well, know. He, might as well, he <laughs> might as well be a member of the Ku Klux Klan then. Exactly. Sake. Exactly. Or a lynch mob or whatever. Yes, you know? I mean, yes, I was yes. shocked. I was yes. shocked. I mean, here's, oh. a, here's a person who came to teach us the difference between right and wrong by Allah's leave, uh, to teach us what is lawful and what is unlawful from the Book of Allah. And now mm. I'm supposed to believe that he was expressing a, a desire to commit a crime because last time I checked, burning down somebody's house is a crime. Yeah. You know, uh, destruction yeah. of property. And, and, and so I was shocked. So that was the day I, I, I stopped reading Bukhari and I never went back. I think Bukhari, quite frankly, is a very unreliable source of the mm. deen. The, mm. You don't find any books, for example, in Bukhari on, uh, on justice, ethics, uh, you know, yes, or yes. Uh, rationality or freedom. It's all missing. This is all missing from, yes. and we are supposed to take our guidance from this book. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this, is, uh, this book is very impoverished compared to the, I mean, you cannot even compare it to the Quran. There is no comparison. Yes. But but so many Muslims are treating them as if they were on the same level. I and mean, this is catastrophic. Or even some of them place Bukhari even above the Book of yes. Allah because they say, well, the Hadith explains, explains the, the Quran. Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously. So now to come back to the Constitution, we need yes. to recover that spirit of tolerance. And once we become more tolerant, once we condemn the suicide bombings, uh, the acid attacks on uh, women who say no to uh, someone who proposes them a marriage or to genital mutilation of both males and females and, and honor killings. We have, once we say no to all these things and jihad al talab let's not forget that one. Yeah. Then, of course, perhaps the image of Islam will uh, be, 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 be different, better, and people will begin to think of Islam as a tolerant religion, which I think it is. And there mm -hmm. will be, as a result, less Islamophobia because people keep saying, oh, Islamophobia, Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. Well, what is causing this Islamophobia? Mm -hmm. Do you think that some of the terror attacks may have something to do with it? Mm -hmm. If that's what is the case, then this is not a case of Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. It is a case of mm -hmm. terrorphobia. Let's be clear yeah, about well, that. The whole world has embraced that concept. 
you see, uh, since 9-11 in particular. There are still people out there who still blame Muslims for that uh, terrible act and that terrible day, uh, although there's plenty of evidence that the Muslims did not do it, you see. But yes, that yes. evidence is being uh, ignored. So what you're discussing here is why has this happened? Why has uh, the Ummah accepted Bukhari uh, over and above the Quran or e e equated both, you see? This is a result of indoctrination, you see. That's Absolutely. It. It's, it has to be a political religious indoctrination or shall we say a religious indoctrination for political purposes. You see, yes. if I can rephrase it that way. Um, I think, uh, dear brother, um, we should not exhaust our listeners here uh, uh, with any more uh, discussion at this point. But I would like to pursue this constitution, maybe even point for point, and I would ask you for, in preparation for our next week, uh, to review it and uh, maybe bring sure. forth some of these salient points that our listeners sure. don't know, you see. Yeah. They don't know about. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they've been misinformed about these particular points and compare it to what the Quran has to say, compare it to what the tafsir has to say in contradiction, you see. And to do this comparison and contrast for the sake of our listeners, so that they don't just think that, hey, this is just an opinion. No, this is this is a, a reality that occurred. This indoctrination happened, and it has affected the Ummah in a negative way, both individually and collectively. Uh, individually, in the eyes, in our own eyes, as we look at ourselves in the mirror, and collectively, in the eyes of the world. You see, that that now considers Muslims to be uh, not only anachronistic, but uh, a, a a horrendous mistake, you see. I, I've come across people in recent discussions that said, oh, well, Muhammad went to Rome, he married a Christian nun named Khadija, and then came back and, you know, did this whole thing just to, oh, I take the Muslims to hell, to take them. Well, what, what's the purpose? <laughs> They're thinking all sorts of absurdities here, brother, that... Um, and, and there are some Muslims who are actually, did Muhammad really do that there? You know, how, how uncertain can they be, you see, of their own faith? And this uncertainty is a result of a lack of truth, is a result of a poor foundation, a foundation that's based on belief and not knowledge, you see. And when you have knowledge and you add that to experience, oh my God, how can you go wrong? Where the Muslim Ummah has gone wrong for these reasons, you see. Maybe they have some knowledge, but they certainly don't have the experience of the truth, you see. The experience is a different matter. The experience does not give you the loss of dominion over yourself or over your collective, no matter where you are, to express the promised land that Allah gave to us, you see, through our unity through our salat with him because that's what salat is the joining you see the joining of heaven connection. and earth a connection it's a connection if you don't have this connection you can't express the truth if you don't if you're not on a solid foundation you can't express the truth you can't serve it and if Allah is the truth and you're ignorant of the truth how can you serve him it's not possible you can serve the exact opposite or somewhere that's on a kind of a neutral ground someplace where, you know, you're just following what's left of your feature, bits and pieces, but the whole thing is not brought together. Islam is Tawheed. If you're fragmented, there's no Tawheed. You cannot perform the deen. If you're separated from your wife because you think she's an inferior creature, not worthy of being educated, how can you perform the deen? It's, it's not possible. So, dear brother, let's give this uh, Medina Constitution or Charter or whatever you want to call it uh, a bit more space and a bit more time in our considerations here. Inshallah, next week, let's uh, pick it up again. Inshallah. Yeah, let's do that. That's a good idea. Right. Good idea. 
Then with that having been said and confirmed and agreed on, I will say wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.